So, this is actually a, a Mishnah in Chapters of the Fathers that actually has multiple parts. Um, it's in Chapter 2. It starts with, well, the, the entire book starts with the process of transmission from Moshe, Moshe from God, God to Moshe, and going down our line here to Joshua, to the elders, to the prophets, etc. And that's how it starts. But it picks up here with Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Um, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai would be between number 30 and number 31 on our chart. Um, and he, he received his vision from, from Hillel. And he had five students. So the five students, are the, they, are, they are the heroes and they are the subjects of today's uh, Mishnah. So it's a very long, it's, it's actually, it's, 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 one, it's one continuous uh, teaching, uh, but it starts off with the five students of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai and what their qualities were. And then he sends them on a very interesting mission, fact-finding mission, two fact-finding missions to be precise. And then it's their individual lesson. So, so it names the, the, um, the five students. One of them is Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Yehoshua, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Shimon, and Rabbi Elazar as well. And that's number one. So the five students that Rabbi Yochanan had. And then it tells us that Rabbi Yochanan and his five students, he would enumerate their praise. It means he gave each one of his students a certain stature. So what were the statures that he gave? He said, Rabbi Yezer, he is like a sealed well that doesn't lose a drop. Rabbi Yezer, such a great student, that whatever you put into him, he remembers. All of Torah is able to keep track of it all. That's how he complimented him. That's the first one. Rabbi Yeshua, what's, his, what's the praise of Rabbi Yeshua? Praiseworthy is his progenitors. He's such, a, he's such a specimen, he's such a diamond, that his progenitors, his parents, it, they're such wonderful people from the fact that they produced such a child. Um, the next one, Rabbi Yossi, he, he called him a chas, he was righteous. Rabbi Shimon is fearful of sin. And Rabbi Lazar is like an overflowing spring, like a spring that like just shoots out water. He always has more Torah, more Torah, more Torah, more and more, more, more Torah. That's how it introduces our character. So five students of Rabbi Yochanan, each one of them has their own qualities and the way their teacher understood their qualities. This is very interesting. I think just as a lesson for us, really not the core point that we want to address, but it shows us the dedication that teachers, usually Jewish teachers traditionally have for their students. They try to analyze them and understand who they are at their core and to be able to define them and identify them with their qualities and therefore tailor their education to their qualities. You know, if you ask Rabbi Yochum Zakkai about his students, he would say, this guy is like this. You know, this one is an overwhelming spring. This one is like a sealed wall that doesn't lose anything. Like, he was able to understand the qualities of their students. And by the way, this is not just in ancient times. Uh, Rabbi Yeruchim, so if you look at number 128 on our list, Rabbi Yeruchim Levavitz, an incredible character. He was actually my grandfather's teacher. Uh, he was a head of a yeshiva that got disbanded during World War I. He left. In 1923, he came back to the yeshiva. And the yeshiva was a flourishing yeshiva with 300 students. After three months, Rabbi Yerucham said that he knows the positive quality of all 300 students. All 300 students, he's able to understand and distill from their interactions what their best positive quality is. Not only that, the majority of them, he also knows their negative qualities. Now think about that. If, if, if you have all that big data, so to speak, this is like machine learning, right? If you have all that data to know what the student, what his makeup is, so to speak, then you know how to tailor you know, your education towards him to make him to reach his full potential. Of course, as parents, as educators, that's what we need to do. We need to know what our kids are like, our students are like, and to be able to direct them in a way that is optimal for who they are specifically, individual 
individually tailored teaching. Very interesting. In fact, when my grandfather ended up in yeshiva in 1934, he was German. Not only that, he was a German's German, right? He was very precise, very punctual, and very kind of stiff a little bit, right? So all the students were talking, all the veteran students were talking to Rabbi Rucham and telling him, what do we do with this guy Walby's with his German Yekeshkeit, as they called it? He's a Yeke, which is, he's so precise. We have, to, we have to destroy it and rebuild him from scratch. These are the conversations that he used to have in yeshivas, right? H- how do we deal with his, you know, his penchant for, for being so, so German? That's what, so all the students suggest we have to start from scratch and kind of rebuild him from scratch. Eruch says, no, we have to build him through his German, like take that and channel that towards greatness. Like, you want to be precise and punctual? Why don't you be precise and punctual in your relationship with God? Try to do everything perfectly. Try to have all your midos, all your characteristics, all that should be perfect. And that, that, that's the tradition of, of, Jewish, of Jewish pedagogy. We see a real Ram Zakai has five students, all very different as we'll see, but he's able to understand the qualities of each one of them. Okay, so what happens? He sends them on a fact-finding mission. So it's actually two missions. Number one, he tells them, I want you guys to go out and investigate and explore and probe and analyze and find what is the proper path that a man should cleave to. And he sends them, and they all go, come back, and they each present their, their findings. And then he says, hmm, I like this guy's more than anyone else's. And then he sends them on another mission. And he says, find the bad path that someone should avoid. And they come back with their findings. And once again, he says, I like this, the last one, the same guy as well. And then the fourth part is where each one of those students has their teachings, their own individual teachings. So what's, what's very fascinating is all the commentators try to connect these four points. A, Rabbi Yochanan and Zakkai's definition of their student. Who are they? What are they, made, what are they made up of? B and C, th- what they discovered when they were trying to find the proper path that someone should cleave and the path that someone should avoid. And, and lastly, D, when they individually taught their own lessons, how does all these things connect? Very fascinating. And people work, you know, people work, there's a lot of work done to try to understand this. So there's a big picture. We're going to focus on specifically their pursuit of life paths. They say, okay, go find the right path that you should cleave to and find a path to avoid. And what's interesting is that these are all opposites. So the first one, um, Rebbe Eliezer says, what is the power path that you should find? It's a good eye. A good eye. And what's the bad thing to avoid? A bad eye. <laughs> the next one, Rebbe Yeshua says, what's the proper path to cleave to? A good friend. And what should you avoid? A bad friend. And thirdly, Rabbi, Shimon sa- uh, Rabbi Yossi says, what should you cleave to? A good neighbor. What should you avoid? A bad neighbor. Lastly, the last one is Rabbi Elazar. He says, what should, you, what should you cleave to? A good heart. What should you avoid? A bad heart. Now, there is one anomaly, because the fourth one is Rabbi Shimon, and he says, what should you cleave to? Anticipating the future. What should you avoid? Borrowing and not paying back. So he's the one that's a little bit off. Everyone else seems to be finding mirror images, good versus bad. Good path to cleave to, bad path to avoid. And he comes up with so all this is very interesting, and we're going to try to understand this bit by bit. So I want to kind of, just, just the idea, like what mission is he sending them on? He's telling them, what is a life path that you should choose? Like, don't we have Torah? Don't we have Torah, like, provide us a life path? We have mitzvahs, we have Torah study. What's wrong with that? What, what precisely is he trying to achieve by telling them, I want you to find some sort of magic bullet, right? Silver bullet. You know, this is something that you cleave to this, and, and then that's the panacea. It's not so clear what he's telling them. Is he telling them? So, uh, is he telling them just like what's a good thing? Well, aren't there a lot of good things? Like, can't we say any part of Torah is a good thing? You know, do any mitzvah is a good thing? 
what exactly is he is is the um, is the intention of this mission? So I want to. I have two. I'm gonna, what I found is that there's so much material here. A and connecting all these four parts together, and specifically in each idea. What I chose to do is I selected one commentary that I liked a lot, and then I developed my own uh, approach in this issue as well. So we're going to go through first the um, the commentary of Rabbeinu Yona. Rabbeinu Yona, I don't think he's on our list. But he would fit in uh, around the time of uh, number between mm, between a hundred and a hundred and three, somewhere in that in that uh, duration. I don't remember his, his exact dates, uh, but he's uh, somewhere in the uh, 12th and 13th century. Uh, he writes a commentary on the bottom here of of chapters of the fathers. An amazing commentary, and he says like this. Rabbi Yona says that what he's telling them to find is a path that's going to lead you to a destination. Right? A path is a destination, right? You start here and you end up there. What he's asking for is that what's the first step to take in your path towards perfection and greatness that once you take this first step, there's a domino effect that invariably will lead you to perfection Entirely. It's almost like a life hack. Right? You start here, but if you do this well, you're guaranteed that everything else will fall into its place. So, for, so the way he presents it, it's very interesting. He says, each one of these discoveries of these five students is a positive thing. To be a good friend, or to have a good friend. Is it to be a good friend, or to have a good friend? That's a huge discussion. To be a good neighbor, or to have a good neighbor. Mm-hmm. We'll see. Uh, but a good eye. We have to define what that means. But these are all positive traits, right? If you have this positive trait and you ensure that you preserve it and you do not negotiate with it, you don't, you, you don't allow for it to be compromised at all, your uncompromising your good eye will lead towards having everything. All the good positive qualities as one. Now the idea here is a very, very deep idea here. And that is that there's a lot of overlap in our behavior. I'll give you an example. If I'm committed to truth, committed entirely, and I'm not going to do anything or think anything or behave anything or say anything that's not true, eventually there will come a point in time where I'll realize that truth also mandates kindness and also mandates patience. And also mandates fidelity to Torah. And also mandates aversion from anger and from sin. So my truth, because I preserve it and ensure that I'm not going to compromise it no matter what, that actually will lead me towards everything. So this is kind of a way where we could take one step in this big journey, but if it's a firm and committed and uncompromising step, that will eventually lead towards everything. So, let's start with these five different ideas. Good eye. What does good eye mean? So this is, like, there's a lot of ambiguity here, right? You know, it's like we used to play baseball. Good eye, right? You know, the guy, uh, you know, the... It's exactly what he says. Good eye is generosity. That's what he says. And he says, if someone is generous, if someone is... Uh, a, a benefactor to other people, benevolent, eventually that will lead someone to perfection and everything. And he goes through all, all, these, f- all these five. Good friend. What does it mean to be a good friend? To be caring, to be loving, to have empathy, to have concern, to have worry. All those things, if you're actually a committed good friend, invariably you'll have everything. You'll achieve greatness in every area of, of your life. Good neighbor. Right? You'll come, come to, res- to respect people, to love people, to be caring for people, to, 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 to worry about other people's well-being, and eventually you come to everything. And he goes through. It's like uh, anticipating the future. What future? So we could say anticipating the future is like, you know, to know, to, you know, to know that tomorrow you're going to have to pay your credit card bill, so make sure that you don't spend too much, right? That's anticipating the future, of course. Mm-hmm. Thinking long-term. But it's also like knowing that, like the Mishnah tells us elsewhere, 
that against our will we're here, we're formed, we are against our will we're born, against our will we live, and against our will we die, and lastly, against our will, we're going to have to give a reckoning and accounting for our behavior. That's also in our future. That's in everyone's future. Well, someone who lives by that mantra, someone has that code of always trying to think long, long, long term, that person will make sure that their actions are just. And by doing that, they'll have everything. And lastly, good heart. So what's a good heart? A good heart is someone who's patient and not quick to anger. And you know, if someone has that, uh, then they'll have everything. So that's what he says. That's how he understands this. And to me, I think that the, the core idea is a very powerful idea. So he's very, very brief in how these connect. But I, I'm trusting him. I think if someone actually is a good friend or a good neighbor, all these things actually work. Uh, and each one of these is a, is, a, is a verified and veritable process and path towards having everything. But I think the idea itself is a very powerful idea. The idea is that what's, what's, what's motivating Rabbi Yochum and Zach and his students? All of them, they have the same goal. Let's achieve perfection of man. Let's try to become great in everything. So what they'll disagree is how it's actually to get there. But that's, everyone's united in purpose. It's a very powerful and underrated idea. And I think that it's still present today. It's still present in, 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 the, in the Torah world, this notion of a life's mission of perfecting yourself. We like to perfect others. That's, we're all experts at that. We could all organize other people's faults and say, well, you know, it's very easy to diagnose someone else, you know. We, we know lots of narcissistic people, but uh, we never meet them in the mirror, right? Never. <laughs> never. They never show up there. You know, that, that, but to look internally and to try to perfect yourself and to make like a classification of all your positive, all your negative characteristics and fight and work and preserve and, and toil and, and like that's a Torah attitude from so long ago and still present today. I, you know, how many people can say that they know someone that doesn't have any negative character? None. Honest. People that will will demand to know when they receive a gift how much it is so they can put it on their taxes. I, I know people like that. I know people like that. They want to do everything a thousand percent with honesty. No bad means. You'll never see them impatient, angry. They won't say, oh, I, I didn't sleep well last night. Don't look at me like I'm... Pfft. Never. Always smiling committed. I know people like that. And where does it come from? Where does it thing come from? You don't meet people like that in the regular world. You don't meet people like that. Everyone has something that is inadmirable. But someone who's committed to Torah, who's grown up in a Torah, grown up not necessarily by age, but grown up in their life with the Torah ideals, they live by this idea. They're asking themselves this question. We should ask ourselves this question as well. What's the proper way that we should that we should, we should do. He had the students, they knew their qualities, number one. And number two, they say, okay, how, what is the path towards this end point, which is what we all want to get to? And that dominated their world. I'm telling you, I know, I, I, I was trying to think what's a fair number without ad- exaggerating. I know for sure tens of people like this, for sure, not a question. Tens, maybe even hundreds of people like this. That the more you know them, the more you realize that just they're just wonderful in every capacity. Where does it come from? Where does such a thing come from? Who, who's heard of such a thing? It comes from the Torah. And from the Torah's lessons. It doesn't exist outside of the Torah. It doesn't. I think it's very, very inspiring. And I think that the, the idea of pursuing greatness is really at the core, certainly, of this book, but really of, of Torah at large. And here it's, it's tactics, but the, the, the bottom line, that's, that's what they're seeking, and that's what we should all be seeking as well. Is it possible 
that each one of them, because of their unique makeup, achieved or discovered a different way towards perfection? Yeah, it's very possible. In fact, I would say it's likely. In fact, from the fact that the preamble to this mission was each one of them's individual character, I don't think that's a coincidence. It's probably by design. They each had different character. And therefore, their approach towards their own individual greatness was different. It's a very powerful idea. So that's the Rabbeinu Yonah, his, 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 uh, um, his interpretation of this, uh, his, uh, of this Mishnah. Now, I want to show you guys some examples. It's like uh, Jacob, a very famous example. Jacob is, uh, is, is giving blessings to his sons at the end of Genesis. And he tells a whole bunch of them about their negative character. Now, if someone, if your dad berated you about your negative character, you say, probably not a blessing. Sounds more like he's chastising. But the truth is, for someone whose life goal is to achieve self-perfection and character refinement, <coughs> that information is gold because that outlines a roadmap for achieving you know, the life mission, character perfection. When there were prophets amongst the Jewish people, right, during this blue era, that's what the prophets were doing all day and all night. They were meeting with people and helping them create a roadmap. And you know what? Prophets go away, and now we're in the red, the red area. No more prophets. You've got to do the work on your own. He sends out the five students. Go find your way to get there. What's the, what's the proper path? And each one comes up with a different path because each one had to work internally to achieve the path and then have the easiness of, of just going to the prophet and have him doing it for you. doesn't mean that the work is done, but at least that the path is done. path is clear. They had to achieve the path on their own and then they had to work on it. And by the way, when we read each one of these five students in the subsequent Mishnahs that they tell us their life lessons... That's the way that they achieved their perfection. So all these parts are connected. And I want to share with you guys what some of my own thoughts on this issue. I want to say maybe a different approach. That when he's, when Rabbi Yochum and Zaka is telling his students to go find the proper path, it's not merely about a starting point, a domino effect to kick you off along your path towards eventually achieving greatness. Rather, it's greatness itself. What is a core, distilled version of total greatness? What's one thing that has everything in it? Not one thing that begets everything. So what does a good eye mean? Good eye, bad eye, which is the flip sides of Rebbe Eliezer. I want to hear the term Ayn Ra or Ayn Hara or Kenahara, those terms. Kena Ayn Hara, Ayn Hara, those terms. Never heard that? Those are common Jewish saying. I see some nods here. Ayn, evil eye. I'm going to turn that without an evil eye. Bli Ayn Hara, without an evil eye. Very common, common phrase. He's telling you that the proper path is to have a good eye. The improper path is to have a bad eye. Well, what's a bad eye? So I want to start with this with the bad eye. What do we know about the bad eye? The evil eye. Okay, let me show you some sources that I found in this. This is a Gemara in the book of Bab Metziah on page 107b. It's talking about Rav. Rav is a number 37 on our list of the chain of Torah transmission. Rav, Shmuel, and Rav Yochanan. They're actually, they're all, they were colleagues. So they're put together. Now, if you want to be totally precise, Rav should have been in green, because Rav was actually in Amora. I told this to my brother. What's the difference between uh, Tanaim? Yes, Tanaim are, are rabbis that are found in the Mishnah, uh, and thus they're part of the first stage in writing down the, the Talmud in Mishnah. Uh, Amoraim are going to be uh, the authors of the Talmud. Um, Rav, uh, number 37, really should have been in green, 
I told this to my brother, the format editing was too difficult. He's like, I'm just going to leave it like that. But you guys know there's a mistake in there. <laughs> so Rav <laughs> made this announcement in the Talmud on the page 107b in Bab Metziah. He says, I went to the cemetery. I talked to the dead bodies. And they told me that 99 out of 100 people die because of ayin ra'a, of bad eye. And one dies because of derech eretz, of the way of the world. Now, if you read this and you're like, Rav, in the spirit of time, we'll take a checklist and go interview dead people, you're missing the point. I think the clear takeaway point is that when we talk about evil eye, it's a very powerful force. It actually could kill people. How does that work? Not only that, this is not the only source. I found multitudes of sources. I'm going to go through the sources quickly. Now, it seems like, by the way, that's a very bad thing, right? If an evil eye is something that's on the bad list, and not only that, it kills people, certainly you would assume that evil eye is an entirely bad thing. However, Sarah, well, before Sarah, Bilam, in this same book of Chapters of the Fathers, on Chapter 5, Mishnah 19, it says like this, it says, Someone should always become a student of Abraham and not a student of Bilam. Why? Uh, or what does that mean to be a student of Abraham and not a student of Bilam? Bilam the wicked. There's three characteristics of the students of Abraham, and the first one is a good eye, Ein Tova. And the bad uh, and the bad side of that, the three characteristics of the students of Bilam. Number one of that is a bad eye. So Bilam was one of the most evil people that ever, ever lived, and he has a bad eye, so obviously it's a negative thing. However, we actually find that Sarah, Sarah had her interactions with Hagar, they weren't always positive, and we're told that Hagar became pregnant, but she miscarried. Why? So Rashi tells us, Sarah Hichnisa ayin ra. Sarah placed an ayin ra on Hagar, causing her to miscarry. Additionally, when Ishmael is sick, why did Ishmael get sick? Because Sarah placed an evil eye on her. So Sarah is a righteous woman, right? Sarah, we learned about Sarah. Sarah is a prophetess. Sarah is, is, is Abraham's partner. Sarah is righteous. And we see Sarah putting an, an evil eye and doing something which we, we would have said pri- previously is actually bad. Not only that, I have stories here. So number uh, 35 on our list is Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon was famous for criticizing the Romans, having to go undercover because the Romans wanted to kill him, ended up in a cave for 12 years that ultimately became 13 years. Why did it become 13 years? Because when he left the cave after studying Torah, for 12 years straight by him and, by, with him and his son, and only subsisting on the carob tree that sprouted miraculously outside of his cave and the stream of water that appeared right when he got there. At, when he left, he goes out and he sees people being involved in mundane things. And the Talmud says that every place where he placed his eye Burned. And the Almighty tells him, in the form of a call, did you come out of the cave to destroy my world? Get back in the cave. He gets back in the cave for a 13th year, comes out, and is a little more subdued. Once again, we see the idea of an eye being very destructive, but not only that, being destructive, even in the form of a very righteous individual um, placing that eye as well. Not only that, I found a very funny and disturbing Gemara at the same time. Um, once again, Rav, Rav, the same Rav who told us that 99% of the people die because of Ayn Ra, evil eye, bad eye. There was an individual who, whose father was not Jewish and mother was Jewish. So we know that Gemara tells us that that child's Jewish, 1,000% Jewish, not a question. So this guy comes to Rav, number 37 on our list, 
and he, he tells them, what's the status of a non-Jew who marries a Jewess and the child uh, of that child? Is the child Jewish or not Jewish? He says, the child's Jewish. He says, okay, I'm that person, let me marry your daughter. Practice what you preach. The Rav was the leader of the Jewish people at the time, one of the great personalities of all time, and this guy comes to him and asks him that question. So he says, no, sorry, no, not happening. So one of the, one of the onlookers tells Rav in the form of a parable, he says, wait a minute, here's the camel, and here's the defined space, let it dance. Basically saying, like, okay, you said this, stand by your word. So Rav announces, if this person was as great as Joshua, the son of Nun, I still would have let him marry my daughter. That's what he says. So the rabbi responds and tells him, yes, if this guy was as great as Joshua, even if you wouldn't let him marry your daughter, but someone else will. But this guy obviously isn't as great as Joshua. Now, if you don't let him marry your daughter, no one else will. Rob got agitated and frustrated. He looked at the guy, and the guy died. Which guy? The, 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 no, not the student, not, the, not, not his colleague, but the other guy. The guy who wanted to marry his daughter. Wanted to marry his daughter. Yeah. So, of course, the obvious question is like, what did the guy do wrong to deserve that? That's a very interesting question. But either way, we see the idea of Rav, a righteous person, placing an eye, and that's being very powerful, very disastrous. So what does that mean? Another story. Can you learn to cast a bad eye? I mean, huh? Can you teach a class? Yes, and I will show you how to do it. I have a few candidates I can look at. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, and and, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain how this actually works. Last story. Last story is about Rav Sheshis. Is Rav Sheshis on our list? Uh, no, but I don't think he's on our list, but he could have made it. Um, one of the very frequently quoted opinions in the Talmud, he was blind. Now, of course, you would assume someone's blind, they wouldn't have the powers to send the evil eye, right? What happened? So, the procession, the cavalcade of the king was coming through town. And Rav Sheshit was going to pay his respects. So there was a Sadducee, this is a Sadducee who was, not, who was, who was lo- walking alongside of him. They said to him, what use is it? You're blind. You'll, you have no idea when the king is even coming. We are coming here to show respect to the king. Rav Sheshit says, listen to me. I'll know when the king is here better than you do. Fine. So they're sitting there together, this, you know, you see what happens here. And the first battalion, the first legion come, and the, t- the guy's like, King's here. He needles Rav Sheshesh, tells him the King's here. He says, no, the King's not here. Second group comes with much fanfare. He's like, ah, now the King's here. He says, no, now the King's not here. The third group comes, and it's very quiet. He says, ah, oh, now the King has arrived. How do you know you're blind? He tells him that the kingdom of of below is like the kingdom of above. And just like the Almighty is called the Mama Daka, the Mighty is not Barash, not with voice. There's a verse in Scripture that says that um, the, the Mighty is not with great fanfare. It's quiet, so too the kings are quiet. So he tells him, fine. Um, either way, the Talmud asks, what's the epilogue to the story? What's, what's the, what happened with this Sadducee? So the Gemara says, Rav Sheish has placed his eye on him, and he died. And not only that, it says he became a pile of bones. So here we see someone who can't even see is placing an eye, and not only that, we see multiple examples of, of people that are certifiably righteous yet doing something which we said something to avoid. So what's going on over here? So I want to explain this like this. My, my grandfather explained this. We think that God runs the world, right? Is that what we think? 
Sure, right? Everyone agrees. That's what, that's, what, that's what believers believe, right? What is the role of free will vis-a-vis that? So God runs the world, yet we have free will. So what Judaism we actually say is that <coughs> God runs the world, and we are partners with God in running the world. We're in the image of God because we're together. God and us are together deciding what happens in the world. So for example, someone's sick. Are they going to live or are they going to die? Well, they're sick, right? So they may die, right? What happens? They go to the hospital and the people give them the medical, requisite medical care and they live. Because we're choosing that they should live. What happens if they didn't go to the hospital? Well, they would have died. So we do play a huge role. Humans do play a huge role. We, our actions matter. But there's even more. We are connected to other people spiritually. We think of us as kind of existing in silos, like we're all on our own. We happen to converge in the world together, but we're each kind of defined. And that's not true. We're each interdependent spiritually, just like we are interdependent uh, economically, I would say. You know, there's no one here that's a farmer and sews their own clothes, right? That's the way it works, right? Everyone does their little slice to contribute to the whole. That's the way it works also spiritually. So therefore, the, my eye is the way I perceive other people. If I have positive feelings towards someone else, then my contribution towards determining what happens in the, to that person are positive. If, my, if I have a negative feeling to them, I don't like their success, I'm jealous of them, I, I look down at them, I have a negative uh, relationship perspective on them, well, then God takes that into account. All that comes into account. We are also in charge of determining the world. So what does it mean to have a good eye? It means to find positivity in everyone that you meet. To, to always have a very positive uh, respect to... Uh, other people. So when we spoke about love, by the way, love every fellow, what does it mean? It means to have a good eye. To always find the positive in someone else, and thus you'll love them. So what's Rebel Ezra saying? Have a good eye. That's, that's not just a domino to bring you to everything, but it's everything. Because what happens if you love everyone as yourself? You'll have everything. You know what? You'll have everything with regards to the relationship with other people, and you'll have everything with regards to the relationship with God. Do you know why? Because they're actually mirrors of each other. The reason why we have a hard time connecting to God is because we're selfish, self-focused. The reason we have a hard time loving other people, having a bad eye, is because we're selfish. And therefore, we break out of our cocoon, and we have a good eye, we open up our heart, both for other people and for God as well. So thus, this indeed is the panacea. This is everything. If you have a good eye, if you have positive relationships with all people, everyone you see is good. Not only you'll positively impact them, but you'll have to change yourself because we're born with a bad eye. We're born kind of existing in a selfish little world. We have to break out of that to have a good eye. And by doing that, we'll actually achieve everything. So in those examples that you made from No, 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 no. That's not what we tell us. We'll explain that. Give me a second here. So Bilam. Bilam is a bad eye, right? Bilam was the most selfish you could ever imagine. Because everyone he saw was someone who's external to them. Abraham is the opposite. Everyone is part of him. Abraham is the greatest person because he's the largest person because he incorporates everyone within him. Therefore, he has a good eye to everyone. Now, if you think about it in a weird way, Abraham is keeping people alive, right? Because Abraham has positive feelings towards everyone, so he's keeping people alive. What happens if you get on the wrong side of someone like Abraham? You die. So it means the greatest people are the people that are keeping you alive, because they're the ones that have a good eye, and they're evoking the very powerful feelings of positivity towards you that God takes into account. And because they're great people, right, their impact of, of their perspective of you matters even more. 
And therefore, they're almost keeping you alive. So in a, in a weird way, we're alive because of the tzaddikim that, are, that, that have positive feelings towards the Jewish people, towards the world at large, towards everyone. What happens if for whatever reason you get on the bad side of someone's righteous? You'll die. So they withdraw their protection. Exactly. They withdraw, withdraw their protection and then you're on your own. You're on your own and all the flood of everyone else's evil eye towards you and you're dead. Right, so that's one is difference of opinion. Or well, okay, so that, that that question is discussed, but the point is it's not that they're killing them. They're not killing them. It's not like Rav Sheshis and Rav. They're killing people. They're just saying I have a bad feeling with this guy. This guy's trying to needle me. I just have a bad feeling with him. Oh, you're on your own. What's going to happen? So, so, so it's a little, it's a little bit of, a, of your question softened a little bit. This guy came to Rav. Says, "Let me marry your daughter." No, even if you're as great as Joshua, you're not marrying my daughter. Sorry, not happening. And you guys live there, whoa, whoa, come on, there's the camel, let it dance. Okay, it's a, Rav didn't kill him. He said, this is someone that I don't want him to marry my daughter, and I don't want him to be, to be, to be bothering me. He's on his own? Okay, we'll see how long he lasts. So if someone is needling you, you should be them. Well, okay, so, is it, so is the, the, well, the point is you want to make sure that the people that are keeping you alive, like, if you have a doctor, right, someone's keeping you alive, don't get on his bad side. Don't get on their bad side. Like, if, the, if, if this person has the switch of whether you live, you live or die, that's the person you should not get on their bad side. It's like do not cross mafia or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Know where you're eating, right? Uh, know where you're being fed. Know who feeds you. Know who, but, know who uh, butters your toast. Oh, all these lines. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's not until that care is lost or withdrawn yeah. that all of the things you didn't know were out there against you come upon mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. And so, and, and so, really, don't get on anybody's bad side. For sure. Because For sure. Everyone, because you yeah. never actually know what someone else could be protecting you. From. That's right. Or uh, inviting for you. Go ahead. We learn mercy not in the way of God about mm-hmm. the side of king that suffer. Mm-hmm. And I pointed out Rabbi Akiva has suffered horribly and says a lot of times a rabbi, which if they look like a righteous person, why are they suffering? They are taking the punishment that do yes. somebody else. Yes, they're, they're like a collective. They're like a collective. Mm-hmm. And there's another angle to that that I actually have over here mm-hmm. that um, the, 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 you know, the kind of the steward of the collective mm-hmm. is going to be the tzaddikim. And therefore, if you are on your own and you're judged as an individual, most of us cannot withstand scrutiny of individual, but if we're part of a collective, part of you know, part of a, part of the Jewish nation, then we'll be meritorious. I, there's a story here. I got to tell you guys a story. This is a verified story. This is I told you a story about the grasshopper and and the and the the 1973 about the guy who uh, who tried to start up with the Rabbi Vadi Yosef. Like those are stories that people know. Like this, that would be an example of, of this idea. But in, in um, Rabbi Akiva Eger, so he was a, a rabbi in Posen. In, uh, in Lithuania slash Germany. Uh, he died in 1836. There's a story that was witnessed by lots of people. Where there was a recalcitrant husband who refused to give his wife a divorce document to get. So the rabbi of the town called him up, come visit me. He came to visit him, like, being very brazen and defiant, and he tells him, give a get to your wife. Let her remarry. You don't want to Right? You don't want to be with her? Don't hold her hostage. So he's like, no, sorry. Okay, tell the rabbi, no, just be careful what you guys get yourself into, right? So the rabbi goes to the shelf, pulls out, pulls out the book of Talmud, he talks about marriage and divorce. And he says, like this, the Mishnah says like this, a man marries a wife, and, they get, and she's free to marry whoever he wants in one of two ways. Either he gives a divorce document, or he dies. And he tells him, which one of these would you like? So the guy laughs him off. What's this guy going to do, right? Laughs him off, right? I'm out of here. He walks out. He goes on the steps. He trips on the steps. He falls and dies. This is, an, this is an event witnessed by people, reliable people. And by the way, if you learn any of Rabbi Kiva Adra's stuff, 
my son Akiva is named after him. Just the connection that he had to Torah and the power that he had as a result is, is unfathomable. And to me, like, the guy should have known. Like, if he's giving you these two options, the red pill, the blue pill, right? <laughs> he's telling you, like, you better choose your pill, right? And he chose poorly and he's dead. But that's an example of, like, the power that the tzaddikim have. How does it work exactly? Is it possible that they, just, they give you a bad eye, it's an active bad eye, they remove the good eye, whatever it is. The point is, is that they have real power because they're, you know, they, like we spoke about last week, if you have the, the yoke of Torah, then it moves you up a level in, in, in kind of the chain, in the, uh, in the pecking order of power. You're not beholden to the laws of nature and the laws of malchut, of kingdom. Yes. Yes. That's right. God has the power. Uh, but the, um, like it says, the might gives Abraham a power of blessing. The might gives a- the mighty gives Abram the power of blessing. Why? Because Abram was special and he got stuff. If you're special, you get stuff from God as well. Right? God gives us power as well. Right? We can lift this. We're, how do I have the power to lift this? That's a more commonly held power. Where does that come from? It also comes from God. Everything, everything that we have comes from God. Our life, of course, and everything about us is only because the Almighty wills us to have that. But the higher levels of power, like for example, I, anyone that you see here, by the way, from the blue, certainly, till the end of the green, right, was able to revive dead people. Every one of them. Every single one of those was able to revive dead people. Every one of them. We, have, we know stories, about, of course, about Elijah and Elisha, but the Talmud makes it clear that those people are incredible giants, and the Almighty, uh, the Almighty consigns his power of life and death, to a certain extent, to these people. We have stories, like stories that are documented and verified and part of the tradition of these people reviving dead people. And it was no big deal. It was no big deal. Because, of course, like, we can lift this. How can you lift this? What do you mean? You're resisting gravity. You have a power. Yeah, but everyone has that power. At that time, it was not a big deal for those people to have that kind of power. It's unbelievable. But that, that's real. But just one thing. You know, in the Betam Shema, yeah. I always think it's interesting that we are to forgive everyone who has done anything against us, whether our body, our property, da 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 so that they will not be punished because of us. That's right. And so we have the power to, to keep someone oh, from yeah. being punished. Of course, of course. And I, to me, I mean, when I first read that, I thought, wow, that's and, and what, awesome. What, but, it's, but it's hard to do that, right? Because you have to work to get that good eye. But once you get the good eye, you have everything as well. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Good friend versus bad friend. Um, what are the benefits of having a good friend? I want to go do this quickly because I want to finish it all. Um, if you have a good friend, a good friend, someone you can study Torah with, Torah with, right? How powerful is that? A good friend is someone that will give you criticism when you need it. And by the way, you'll give him criticism when he needs it, him or her. A good friend, someone that you can rely. Like if, if you have a good friend that tells you something. By the way, I think you made a mistake. That's a very powerful thing to have. It's a par- very powerful asset because that will make sure it's 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 it's, it's someone's uh, second opinion or th- external opinion. That's an unbiased opinion that'll help you become become perfect. And by the way, when you have a good a good friend, and you have someone who can give you advice and someone who can be a confidant. So a real good friend is someone who will help you have everything. Because any mistake that you make, hopefully, you're about to learn from their examples because they're a good person. But also, a mistake that you have, that you make, they'll be help, help you to, to, uh, to uh, uh, overcome it and to, and, to, and to change and perfect it. What about a good neighbor? What does it take to have a good neighbor or to be a good neighbor? Now, a friend is someone that you engage with Selectively, right? You meet them maybe a couple times a week or, or whatever. A neighbor is constant. What's the closest neighbor that we all have? Wife. Our spouse, that's right. What does it take to be a good spouse? Good friend. Huh? Just no. Yes. Good friend. It takes, you have to become a great person. Right? To be a good spouse, you have to become a great person. There's no other way to do it. Because 
because there's no time that you could say, like, okay, I'll be good for five minutes and then I'm done. Like, if you have a meeting with your boss, right? You know that you have to be on best behavior for an hour, right? But then you can go back to being yourself, right? With your wife or your husband or your spouse or your kids or your neighbors, it's your life. What does it mean to be a good, a good neighbor? It means to become someone who actually is a good neighbor all the time. To do that, you can't just say, I'll behave like that. You have to actually become like that. Or you say, I'll behave like that for the next 70 years, which is becoming that, by the way. It's the same thing. So, indeed, we could say that to become a good neighbor is someone, is to, how do you do that? Well, you've got to change. You've got to become perfection. Achieve perfection. And what does it mean to anticipate the future? So we already mentioned this a little bit. The next one. Well, what future do we all share? There's a future that we all share. And that's that we're going to be dead. And we're going to have to give an accounting and a reckoning for, for our behavior. So what, someone who anticipates the future is someone that ensures now that tomorrow they'll be in good hands. So people that invest in your future, tell kids, right? Go to college, invest in your future, right? What does that mean? It means that you have, you have you know, 50, 60 years ahead of you, and you want to make sure that you put in the hard work now, so that way down the line, it'll be better off for you. You'll have a decent job, you'll have a good career, you'll have a decent degree, and then you start putting away to your retirement, right? That's anticipating the future. Don't just say, well, things are good now, let's just spend all the money that I have, live paycheck to paycheck. Right? That's, you know, that's responsible to say, I'm going to invest in my future. Well, what, what, what about then? Like, sometimes, unfortunately, we get off the train one stop before our destination, right? We plan, okay, t- today, we don't just plan to retire at 65 and to live, you gotta have enough money until you're 80. You gotta have enough money until you're 100, right? But even, even more of a future, you gotta plan even more. Well, what happens after your 100th? We know. We know we've given accounting and a reckoning for our behavior. What, where's our spiritual 401k? What are we putting in there? That's also part of our future. And we got to plan for our retirement. We got to plan, well, well, where's our real retirement? It's in Olam Abba. What's our real retirement? Got to plan for it. Got to invest in it. Got to put away money for it. And by the way, nowadays we have much longer retirements, 35 to 100. Got, you know, 65 to 100. Got 35 years of retirement. How many years are you going to have in Olam Abba? More, for sure. <laughs> That's, it's eternity. Doesn't it make sense to also invest in that future? Of course. So what do you do for that, right? Just like you'd say, okay, every month, every month you're going to do uh, your matching, right? Your employer will match. Well, make a deposit of mitzvahs also. Do matching mitzvahs. Scoop up mitzvahs. Avoid Pitfalls, right? Correct your behavior. Correct your priorities. Invest towards your future. I'll tell you an example of some stuff that I do to try to encourage my kids to kind of have this attitude. We, we go to shul, we drive to shul before Shabbos, and we drive to shul, we drive home after Shabbos. I tell my kids, whenever they come to me to shul Friday night, I say, I say one kid look out one window, other kid look out the other window. Why? to see if there's anyone that's walking the shul, give them a ride. So we have two ways to get to, to, get, to, to, get to shul, right? There's, you make a right on the first street or on the second street, and then they converge. So I slow down at the first, I say, is anyone walking on that street? And then we'll make a right over here and pick them up. Otherwise, we'll go to the next street and see if there's anyone walking there. I talk to kids every week. But like, I'm trying to integrate with them in an attitude of like, we're always looking like we do in the rest of our life, looking for for an edge, right? Try and find some sort of edge to make some more money or to advance or to perfect or always update your resume. You know, we're always on top of our physical 401k to anticipate our future. We want to get the kids in kind of the, in, the, in the mode of what about our spiritual 401k? What about that future? We got to anticipate that future as well. Always be on the prowl for more mitzvahs and avoidance of sin. Just like we should avoid, you know, making financial mistakes, right? So what's the flip side of that? So that, that the flip side of, of, 
of Rabbi Shimon, who says positive thing is to look for the future. Well, if you have that, if you have this attitude of looking to the future, anticipating the future, well, then you'll have everything. Of course. So we see, like, if you have this attitude of looking towards the future, you'll have everything. Well, what's the flip side? The flip side is, is not to, uh, not to borrow without paying back. It's like almost a perfect parallel. You know, we talk about financial literacy. You know, people say, like, well, I mean, how do you pay for it? Pay for it with the, with the plastic. It just, it swipes and you're able, you, you get a receipt and you leave, right? That's it, you're good to go, right? And the problem is you fall into a, a pattern of spending beyond your means and then you're paying 19% interest rate forever. And you have poor credit rating. And then it becomes even more expensive to buy a house or to buy, to get a car. But sometimes there's the spiritual component to this as well. We also have to make sure that when we borrow, so to speak, spiritually, right, we're not living in the present only. We're also living, anticipating the future. All our debts come to, come to bear, right? There's no way to... The Almighty is a little bit like, uh, like, like the IRS, right? I just not part of the IRS. Like, uh, like property taxes, <laughs> right? There's no way uh, unless, well, maybe it's like the IRS. You negotiate with the IRS, right? You absolve it. It's like student loans, right? There's no way unless you take care of something, unless you address it. You know, we have the holiday now of, of Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. It's about repentance. Repentance is like what Bernie Sanders wants, right? Just absolve all the loans, it's great. That's what repentance is, all the loans. But the loans are there unless you, unless you tend to them, unless you pay those loans either in the form of remuneration, which we'd like to avoid, or in the form of absolvement in the form of repentance and rectifying one's ways. They're there. And that's the worst way to go, to live in the present, to only think about today, to borrow and not pay back. Anticipate the future, have an eye to the future, and live accordingly. And what's lastly? Good heart. What's a good heart? What's a heart? You should love the Almighty with all your hearts. What's your heart? Dan, you mentioned this last time. What's a heart? It's the, uh, the, the, the heart swinging there. Yeah. You know? yeah. It's your, your, your toe and your toe. Booyah. So let me have a good heart. not to have a bad heart. It means to eliminate your bad heart. Eliminate your Yetzirah. And by the way, what happens if you eliminate your Yetzirah? So it's an interesting thing. We're told that the mitzvahs correspond to the limbs. Remember that? 248 mitzvahs correspond to 248 limbs. Which mitzvah corresponds to the heart? I mentioned this in a class a couple of months ago. The mitzvah of faith in God. The first mitzvah in the Torah. The first mitzvah of the Ten Commandments. Have faith. That's your heart. What's the mitzvah of, of faith? It's to remove the bad heart and have the good heart. And by the way, you'll know all Torah. That's right. That's the one thing. That's all, all Torah, all mitzvahs are all at the root about Amunah, about having a good heart. Thus, Thus says Rabbi Elazar, that's the way to get everything. And what is Rabbi Yochum and Zakeh? How does he answer? How does he, how does he, which one of these does he, does he choose? Four, five different approaches to achieving everything. He says, a good heart. Do you know why? Because everything else that was described previously, to have a good eye, to have a good friend, to have a good neighbor, to anticipate the future, anticipate the future, have a good heart. They're all different ways of saying the same thing. They're all different ways of fighting someone's Yetzirah and trying to eliminate it. Good eye. What does it mean? Yetzirah wants you to be selfish. Yetzirah is all about focusing on you and material pleasures now. So what are other people? Well, they're obstacles to that. Okay, so have a good eye is to fight your Yetzirah. What is a good friend? 
Good friend brings you clarity. Good friend gives you criticism when it's constructive. What is that criticism fighting? It's a fighting against Iraq. It's a cheap, a trying to achieve a good heart. A good neighbor, right? Someone that forces you to resist your Yetzirah, to overcome your inclination towards negativity and bad midos. And of course, the overarching goal of your Yetzirah is to make you forget that we're living in this big continuum that this world brings us to the next world. It's all about having that far God within you that tells you that, no, this is the world that you've got. It's the only one you've got and the only one that matters. The future is not... Don't think about the future. He tells you to take your matzah. What's matzah? Matzah is nutrition. Turn it into bread. What's bread? Bread's a nice experience. It tells you to take this world and make it not something, a means to the future, not just something that's going to bring you towards your true goal, but rather something that's a goal on its own. He doesn't want you to anticipate your future. Don't think about the future. Swipe the card. Borrow, don't worry about paying it back. It works, right? It just works. I know people, I've heard this from people. To me, it's, it's mind-blowing. I heard some people that they've, they went shopping. And like, yeah, it just, it just swiped. Like, they, they, nothing connected to them. They just swiped and like, and now they're having uh, debt collectors and they can't get a mortgage. And they have no idea how those two are even linked. And as preposterous as that, that sounds, like we're like that as well. We're at the time where everything's free. We're just swiping. And like, pfft. we don't think about the future. And that's exactly where the HR wants us to be. We're, we're exactly in his mindset. Borrow, borrow, don't, don't worry about paying back. But the truth behind the scenes, our ledger is being written. And the hope is that we can anticipate the future and thus thwart his nefarious plans for us. So, in conclusion, the mission is clearly... Uh, there's a lot there. There's a lot of commentaries in there. The, the beginning and introductory and how it all connects and how their each individual's vantage point is a reflection of their own character and is also embodied by their uh, lessons that they teach afterwards. It's very interesting. We could probably make a, a whole session about trying to piece it all together and how it all connects. Uh, but clearly they were motivated by a mission a mission, that's the Jewish mission, that's the Torah's purpose, and that is to achieve perfection, to achieve greatness. And the lesson, the takeaway lesson for us is, is that at the core of it all, it's about battling our Yetzirah. Our Yetzirah wants us to live in the present, to have the evil eye, to be, to be self-centered, self-focused, to not think about other people only negatively, their successes equals our failures. Like the millionaires and millionaires. They're the ones. They're, all the politicians want to tell us that all the other people that caused our misery. Never do they point a finger at us and say, mm, maybe you're also a contributor in this. That, oh, no. And that's reinforcing our Yitzhak, our evil eye. It's always other people that are responsible for your lack of, su- of success. Good friend. Yitzhak doesn't want you to have a good friend. A good friend is an ally, an ally in your mission, a good neighbor, someone that you can learn from. And by the way, being a good neighbor forces you to dismantle the network of terror that the Yetzirah gives, gives you. And of course, to anticipate the future, all that is included in a good heart. And that's indeed our life's goal. And the hope is, is that we take the lessons and the inspiration from the people of yesterday that they were battling with the same Yetzirah that we have. It took on different forms, but the core was, it was all the same. It's all, swipe the card, live in the present, don't think too much about your future. And certainly now is the holiday. Rosh Hashanah, we're about to get the holiday, where this is all the holiday is about. It's all about recalibrating our life and our priorities. We live the whole year, and we have the chauffeur. The chauffeur wakes us up. Wake up, there's a future. Wake up, the credit card bill is going to be due. What are you going to do then? That's what the chauffeur is. It's a clarion call from American Express. (laughs) 
That's what it is. Ram says, the Ram tells us, the mitzvah of Shofar is a mitzvah, the Torah says. But the lesson, Uru wake up those that are sleeping from your sleep. We're sleeping. We don't realize. We're, we're totally oblivious. And this is the holiday to wake up. And I think it also dovetails real nicely with what we've been speaking about the past couple of weeks, about the Yetzirah. The Yetzirah, what it is, how it plays a role in our life, and how our mission is to, is to combat it. And the Torah is what we use. So let's take that inspiration and uh, really take the lessons home. And uh, let's, maybe we too could also have a good heart. And a good heart, love a good eye. Good friends will help us along the way. Being a good neighbor will mandate, will demand of us that. And certainly, let's keep an eye to our future. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you.